So um, our speaker today will be Dr. Ramaswamy Govindan. So Dr. Govindan is a professor of medicine and the director for the section of medical oncology at the Washington University School of Medicine. He is also the Anheuser Bush Endowed Chair in Medical Oncology. His research interests include predicting outcomes in patients with early stage non-cell small non-small cell lung cancer using genomic studies and developing novel um, therapeutic options for patients with non-small cell lung cancer. In addition, his research group is interested in studying molecular changes associated with lung cancer in lifelong never smokers. He has also led a number of institutional and multi-center phase two and three studies in lung cancer over the past decade. He has received numerous awards, including the 2020 American Association for Cancer Research Team Science Award. And he also holds a position of co-chair of the Lung Cancer Group for the Cancer Genome Atlas Project, a national effort to describe the genomic alterations of common cancers. Today, he will be giving a presentation titled, Proteogenomic Alterations in Lung Cancer, Clinical Implications. Without further ado, I will hand over the stage to Dr. Ramaswamy Govindan. Thank you, Dr. Patel. Um, I just want to um, thank you for this invitation. Uh, it is too bad that we have to do this over the, over the Zoom um, uh, technology. I wish I, I could be there in the lovely city of Miami. I also wanna compliment all of you for this tremendous progress you've made <clears throat> with regard to cancer and other areas. And I especially appreciate the warm welcome from my dear friend, Craig Lockhart, uh, Gilberto, and also the, from Dr. Weiss. So today I thought I'll talk to you about the proteogenomic alterations of lung cancer. And I fully recognize that this is a general medical audience and not necessarily those who think about cancer all the time. I still thought this will be a good idea. It will be a good idea to focus on uh, one cancer to show what you can learn by studying these genomic alterations. And I am very mindful of this fact that this is a general audience, and I'll keep this um, at a fairly an overview level. Um, in, these are my disclosures, nothing relevant to this presentation. And I just want to look at this chest X-ray from a patient with lung cancer, had multiple nodules here, you can appreciate and a dramatic clearance. And uh, the most spectacular part of this um, uh, slide, in my opinion, is not the radiographic resolution, which is quite nice for the date that you can see. And within five days, you can see a dramatic resolution of these nodules. And around this time, we began to grapple with the idea that the lung cancer is not one disease, lung adenocarcinoma is not one disease. And in this instance, this patient responded dramatically to a drug called gefitinib, an inhibitor of EGFR, epidermal growth factor receptor. At that time, we didn't have very much, uh, we didn't have a very good understanding of these alterations that happen in these patients. We began to treat patients empirically, gave this drug to everybody. And then a few years down the line, we discovered that these traumatic responses happened because these cells were addicted to this pathway. These cells carried a mutation in EGFR, a gene that has now become widely known to be affected in lung cancer. But the point of this slide is to show that within a few days, you can see dramatic responses when you give the right drug to the right patient. And then subsequently, we learned that EGFR mutation is not the only thing driving these cancers. And this is a slide uh, picture from my dear colleague, Alice Shah, then from Mass General uh, Hospital, subsequently published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, a patient who was in hospice care with extensive cancer. And I don't have to tell you this, uh, this group that this lung it was full of cancer. And then within a few months of therapy, it almost became normal. This person got off hospice care and oxygen dependency. And this is a very dramatic resolution. In this instance, not driven by EGFR, but another gene in the RAS pathway, RTK pathway, receptor tyrosine kinase pathway, the ROS1 that led to a dramatic resolution. And then there are numerous examples. This patient in particular, my own patient, was again on hospice care. When we saw us, uh, uh, we found that this tumor was driven by a mutation in the HER2 gene. And we had a specific trial for this patient and that gave her a good three years after that. And then this is a gentleman I took care of 10, 10 years with metastatic uh, uh, lung cancer driven by a different gene called ALK, anaplastic lymphoma kinase. You know, you wouldn't think of somebody living 10 plus years after a metastatic disease from lung cancer. 
and such is the power of targeted therapy. And then here is an example more recently, a target that we never thought would be druggable. This, this patient's tumor was driven by a KRAS gene, a particular genotype G12C. Specific inhibitors have been developed. A number of clinical trials are ongoing. While this is not yet approved for regular use, this is a patient of mine, if I'm not mistaken, the very first patient who responded fairly dramatically uh, to the G12C inhibitor and uh, doing quite well uh, even now after a year and a half. Um, so it really shows that if you can identify the biology and treat this appropriately, you can have profound uh, influence on this. This was not the way we practice medicine uh, before, at least in the world of cancer. And this is a paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine back in 2002, right around the time I showed you the patient with the chest X-ray being treated with jafitinib. If you look at this, we tested at that time four different regimens, and we agonized at that point which one was better. I'm not kidding. And there were serious discussions that one particular one, the top of the curve here was better than the rest of it. And there were serious discussion as to why it was so. A simple explanation was that the scans were done less frequently. And we were at that point treating these patients empirically with the chemotherapy regimens and, and really dissecting these minor inconsequential dis, uh, differences. But then the world has changed in the last 18 years. And my point of this talk is essentially show how that has changed and what lessons have we learned and where we are going from here. And again, this is not unique to lung cancer. As I said earlier on, these are applicable to many other cancers. Just to back up a little bit, cancer at its core, it's very hard, basically is a disease of the genes, a disease of cellular genome. And these genes get altered. And as you know, there are 20,000 genes in each and every cell in our body and about 300 to 400 are cancer associated genes. And these alterations can drive these cancers. A simple example is a single nucleotide gets changed and we see this all the time, a particular mutation, the EGFR gene can make that um, pathway very active and the cells can get dependent on it. It can cause transformation of a normal cell into a cancer cell. Or there can be excessive copy numbers of a particular gene. HER2, for example, can be amplified or overexpressed. Or there can be rearrangements where a significant a portion of the G chromosome can get inverted as happens in this gene called ALK in lung cancer that can really bring this into an active state by having a partner with, uh, with activation of the gene. And there could be some specific methylation changes that can, they can derepress an oncogene or they can repress an oncogene or uh, they can derepress an oncogene um, or activate, um, activate an oncogene or uh, suppress the tumor uh, uh, suppressors. And so that can lead to these changes. So essentially the, the point of that is to suppress the tumor suppressors and activate oncogenes and that can lead to cancer formation. And about 10 years ago, when we did this quick analysis on the cosmic network, asked a very simple question how many mutations have been looked at in lung cancer and reported. This was the ultimate clearinghouse repository where we deposited information um, called Cosmic Data Set. At that time, we had knowledge of alterations only in 4% of the genome and 4% of the genes of 20,000 genes. We looked at nearly 800 genes. Even there, we looked at different segments of the genes, not the entire gene length because the technology then was looking at some what we call hotspots or a few regions of the gene. So we had very limited knowledge of these alterations in cancer, much like looking at the tail of an elephant and figuring out the rest of the elephant, how it would look. And that's how, how much we, we knew about that. But things have changed over the next uh, 10 years. And uh, the big catalyst in the effort is this big project called the Human Genome Project, where uh, the mapping of the human genome took place by two different uh, groups, a private enterprise led by Craig Venter and the public uh, partnership, a public uh, enterprise led by the National Institute of Health. And this really opened up the field. And I'm very proud to say that Washington University played a major role and one of the key uh, institution that uh, led this effort. And out of that uh, came other projects and chiefly the sequencing of cancer genome. Uh, here you see Rick Wilson uh, uh, here and Tim Lay, uh, who led this, uh, the very first whole genome sequencing of a cancer patient. And it is also, this happened uh, in 2008, just about 12 years ago. And uh, the Human Genome Project cost roughly about $3 billion. Uh, 
and the, the human ge genome sequencing of a cancer patient where we did both the tumor genome from a normal tissue from the cancer patient's skin sample and also the tumor sample uh, here, and that cost us merely a million and a half dollars. And today we can do this for a few thousand dollars. And what it took about 10 years to do human genome sequencing, the very first human genome, this took, uh, the cancer genome took about a year and a half. Now we can literally do this in a few days. I'll show you towards the end. We can do this in literally three days and do the analysis. And really in the last 12 years, the technology has changed profoundly and that is affecting patient care. This is not just some uh, fancy pants research and really we can learn quite a bit. <clears throat> there is a big effort uh, called the Cancer Genome Atlas Project led by the National Cancer Institute and the National Institute of Genome Research. And that really helped us map uh, uh, these genomic alterations using the whole exome and, and to a great extent and some whole genome and whole transcriptome uh, from 11,000 patients uh, harboring 33 different tumor types, including 10 rare cancers. And if you have to put all the data that would require about 200 plus thousand DVDs, that amount of data were generated at this, and they're all available for public use. And a lot of data are available for public use and some uh, with appropriate authorization, even more extensive data are available. Out of that, we publish a number of effort, uh, various different cancers, and we combine them all together called the Pan Cancer Network. And thousands of publications have come out of this effort, not only led by the investigators as a part of the TCGA, also from others uh, who have mined this data. And if you look at lung cancer alone, this is a list uh, we updated uh, three years ago, and I've, start update, I've stopped updating that, partly because these data are coming fast and furious. And as you can see here, I showed you in 2011, the cosmic data set had only 4% of the human genome. Now we are talking about all 20,000 genes, not only in a few samples, but in thousands of samples. Today, we have data from over 3,000 samples from non-small cell lung cancer, several hundreds from small cell lung cancer, and we learned quite a bit. And that's the purpose of this talk. And for the first earlier part of our discovery, we were focusing a lot on the uh, genome, that's the DNA, either using the coding regions, that's the whole exome, or the non-coding regions, including non-coding regions, the whole genome coding and non-coding regions. And now we have moved on to look at the transcriptome, and I'll show a little bit of the data from the proteomic analysis as well, and the technology has really helped us uh, discern these alterations. And of course, this is a classic example of team effort. Uh, this is not led by one or two people and there are literally hundreds of um, investigators who helped us along the way. And uh, various different organizations have been part of. So I'm showing the collective work from easily 400 to 500 individuals who contributed to these data. So I take no credit for this uh, myself. I've just been a conductor on some of these projects, overseeing these things and bringing people together. And uh, I'm grateful to all my colleagues who really helped us uh, achieve what we've learned. So I thought I'll talk about a few different areas here. And uh, I'll just begin by showing what we've learned from lung adenocarcinoma. Then I'm gonna show a few examples of how we can learn the mechanisms of treatment resistance, metastasis, and what predisposes patients to cancer, and then where we're gonna go in the future. And as you know, lung cancer, the most common type is a non-small cell lung cancer. The most common subtype is a lung adenocarcinoma. And 15, 20 years ago, if you had to draw the pie chart, we would come up with a simple pie chart where we would say about 15 to 20% of them had KRAS mutation, a gene that has been known to be altered in lung cancer for a number of years. We wouldn't have known the rest of the, the stuff. And the initial TCGA paper published in 2014 uh, showed that 75% of the lung adenocarcinoma have potentially targetable alterations. Many of them have drugs available either as a part of a clinical trial or approved drugs today in the clinic. There remained about 25% where we couldn't really find what was driving these cancers in terms of these uh, oncogenic alterations. We took a further stab at this in a later paper in 2016 and amplified, expanded the data set and we found additional alterations that are color-coded here in red. And these are members of what we call the RAS receptor tyrosine kinase pathway, various different alterations, a point mutations in certain genes, a fusion element that activated these genes, amplifications of uh, some genes, as you can see here, or suppressing 
an inhibitor of this uh, pathway. For example, RASA1 is a tumor suppressor. Inhibition or loss of this led to activation of the RAS uh, RTK pathway. And so we filled that gap a little bit. And again, we had about 15% or so left unaccounted for. And, um, and that, uh, that we explored this in a later paper I'll show you in a minute. We also showed in the 2016 paper that lung adenocarcinoma and lung squamous cell carcinoma, even though they arise in lung cancer, they're distinctly different diseases. Lung squamous cell cancer, for example, has unique alterations in these genes. Lung adenocarcinoma has alterations in these genes, and there are some that are overlapping or shared between the two, showing that these are largely two different diseases. We also showed in that paper that lung squamous cell had a lot more in common with head and neck squamous cell cancer than lung adenocarcinoma. So the cell of origin, the transcriptional state, and all of them make a big difference rather than the their organ of origin. So we learned that quite a bit. And um, in terms of further alterations that we are looking for in a paper that's going to come out fairly soon, we took us we we looked at about hundred samples where we didn't really know any alterations driving them in the whole exome sequencing that is looking at the coding regions. And by looking at the entire coding and non-coding regions, and we found additional alterations, including mutations in the KRAS that were missed in the whole, sequ whole exome sequencing because the coverage in the whole exome sequencing in exon one wasn't very good. The whole genome picked up a lot more alterations. And this is particularly noteworthy because if you have a KRAS G12C mutation today, these patients would be considered for uh, clinical trials that target this particular mutation where we have seen some very encouraging, promising activity for these patients. We also found unique alterations where structural rearrangement where EGFR gene was uh, amplified to a significant extent compared to the rest of the population here. This sample had significantly high expression of EGFR, suggesting that this amplification is clinically meaningful and uh, had a particular biological effect. We also found a tumor deletion um, in a gene called RASA1 I mentioned before, and that was missed in the whole exome sequencing and that was picked up uh, in, uh, with a deletion in the promoter region and uh, that led to a significant decreased expression. So really showing that what could be missed by a whole exome sequencing could be picked up by the whole genome sequencing. And we also showed that the tumors that lack these oncogene activation were enriched for uh, loss of tumor suppressors, particularly the P53 key point SDK11. These are well-known tumor suppressors. And despite whole genome and whole exome alteration analysis, we found that these tumors are driven by tumor suppressor loss uh, more than oncogenic alteration. So we do believe that there are some small proportion of these lung tumors, lung adenocarcinomas driven exclusively by the loss of tumor suppressors. And um, we, are, we are actually taking some of those samples where we have not found anything. I would say about 10% of lung adenocarcinomas do not have oncogenic alterations in the RAS RTK pathway. And we're subjecting them to a whole proteomic analysis currently, and hopefully we'll find a few more alterations that we missed. But I think they are driven largely by, um, by tumor suppressor loss. And then the second item I want to talk about here is that uh, the smokers and non-smokers. 15% of lung adenocarcinoma uh, SAM tumors are, are we see in patients who are lifelong non-smokers. That number is significantly high if you go to Asia and significantly low if you go to Kentucky or someplace where there's heavy tobacco use. So in some parts of Asia, 40% of lung tumors are driven by non-smokers or non-smokers are uh, uh, account for 40% of those patients with lung cancer. There is a big difference. And here is an example of uh, one of our own patients a smoker who had uh, 50,000 mutation, a single sample here. And here is an uh, example of a patient with a non-smoker and very few mutations, almost, almost 50 times. Uh, uh, when we do the analysis, tenfold less mutation burden and never smoker compared to smokers. And uh, we are actually looking at this further in an upcoming paper and reporting that nearly 90% of them have a potentially targetable alteration. And when you compare the alterations that are enriched in never smokers, we see obviously EGFR, a well-known driver in the never smokers. And we find uh, an additional alterations like uh, SED2, another um, gene of great interest enriched in never smokers and uh, genes involved in signaling pathway 
And compared to the smokers, we see a different set of gene alterations. So they are somewhat overlapping, but they are they're also distinctly different disease. The biggest difference is that the mutation burden is significantly low in never smoke a lung adenocarcinoma. Smokers obviously have a number of years, and a lot of these mutations have carried over through the lives of these cancer cells and over time. And so all of them call, uh, beg this question, what should be our test in the clinical space? And today, I think we are, most of us are using panel testing to look for commonly altered genes to decide therapies. Clearly a patient who has EGFR mutation will not derive any benefit from a drug that target ALK gene and vice versa. So it's important to find this, as important as finding the histological subtype or confirming the diagnosis of cancer. The question really is what technology? And limited whole exome, deep whole exome is what is being done by the panel testing today, a limited panel of genes. And we have recently come up with a pipeline where we do a whole genome sequencing and we can do the analysis within a couple of days. And this paper is gonna come out anytime showing this utility in leukemia and we find that the same technology can be used in uh, lung cancer as well. In the limited sample set of 10 uh, samples, we found that uh, this picked up every single known alteration. And what is remarkable is that the number of, um, you, know, um, um, you know, the amount of nucleic acid that we need is very low here, as you can see here, um, with a very small amount of DNA, we can, we can get this with 43 nanograms, we can get that, so it really, useful for small core samples, limited yield, where we can do this. In one go, we can look at point mutations, structural variations, copy number alterations, and the whole thing. And uh, so this is something that we are very keen on expanding this in the lung cancer space. You can get the results in a few days. And uh, again, um, this is really showing that how much we can, uh, we can use the power of technology to keep improving this. Speaking of technology, and uh, you know, a few years ago, we could only do the proteomic analysis on a few, a limited number of uh, proteins. And now using mass spec, uh, we can really look at uh, thousands of, uh, ten thousands of um, uh, protein and pro post-translational modifications. And this is a paper we published a few months ago using um, uh, the support of uh, national, the National Cancer Institute, a effort called CPTAC where we looked at the proteogenomic alterations in lung adenocarcinoma in over 100 samples from lung adenocarcinoma. I won't go into the details here. The paper, uh, something you can look up, um, for, look it up for the details. I'll just point out that this is one of the largest, the most comprehensive analysis ever been published in lung adenocarcinoma. Not only look at the whole genome and whole exome analysis, but also transcriptome as well as the proteomic analysis of um, uh, total proteins, 10,000 proteins. I'm sure hopefully technology will go to look at hundreds of thousands of proteins in the coming years. Also, we looked at over 40,000 phosphorylation event in these proteins and acetylation event, and uh, a number of other cancer types are being looked at, and eventually we'll be combining various different types and do this pan-cancer analysis as well. I'll just highlight a few things from this paper. And uh, there's only one important story I want to tell you from this. It is the story of SHIP2. SHIP2 is an important um, a protein uh, seen, seen to be here, uh, particularly phosphorylated at the well-known activation site, Y62, and in exclusively in EGFR mutant samples. And the important message here is that if you look at the gene PTP11, it is not mutated, it is not rearranged, it is not amplified. So whole genome, whole exome analysis will not tell you this, not even transcriptome. And only the proteomic analysis, particularly the post translational modification will tell you that in the EGFR mutant samples, this phosphorylation event is off the chart compared to the rest of them. And it seems to be almost exclusively altered in EGFR mutant samples. Why is this important? This is quite important because now SHIP2 inhibitors are entering clinical trials. And one could conceive of a scenario where EGFR mutant tumors should be, should be treated with a combination of EGFR inhibitors with SHIP2 inhibitors. And those studies are being planned. That's true for the KRAS mutation as well. There is another gene, uh, is SOS, uh, also is, uh, is uh, an important uh, in this targeting this. So it really shows that the proteomic analysis can tell you what the whole genome exome and the, even the whole total protein analysis doesn't tell you at the phosphorylation event, um, uh, particularly here. And there are a number of other important stories that has, uh, that has been presented in this, and I would encourage you to read this paper. Moving on to the second part of the talk, 
uh, what can we learn about the resistance of um, and res small lung cancer or any cancer in terms of resistance? The key is to analyze the sample at the time of resistance. And all the um, studies from the Cancer Genome Atlas project, the TCGA project, or the CPTAC project, all were obtained from surgically resected early stage tumors. These tumors have not been subjected to selection pressure from uh, therapy, for example, the targeted therapy or chemotherapy. These are treatment naive samples. So you can learn some important um, you know, um, uh, lessons from those samples, but then the resistance or the mechanisms of resistance, you cannot learn from that because these samples have not been exposed to those things, uh, targeted therapies or chemotherapy. So we wanted to ask this question, what is driving the resistance in small cell lung cancer? A bit of a background, small cell lung cancer accounts for about 10% of all lung cancer samples, so today 10 to 15% of all lung cancer. Small cell lung cancer is seen almost exclusively in smokers. In my 25 years career, I've only seen about five or six patients with small cell who are lifelong non-smokers. Small cell is also a disease where we know a lot about the biology to begin with. A small cell is a disease caused by concurrent loss of P53 and RB. Here is a beautiful paper from the group from Germany showing that loss of P53 and RB is seen in almost all samples in small cell. Even the others have the loss through complex rearrangement not picked up. And so that's the basic biology. What is unique about small cell is that at diagnosis, these patients are remarkably sensitive to chemotherapy. Plain old chemotherapy with platinum and atopicide causes response rates dramatically. 60, 70%, fairly dramatic resolution. Patients with 15 lesions in the liver can now go to literally no lesions in the liver in six weeks with plain old chemotherapy. But then unfortunately and predictably, within four to six months, they develop progressive disease and that's remarkably resistant to uh, chemotherapy of any kind. So much so that we, do, we have not made significant advances in this area, despite a few modest, uh, uh, you know, areas of improvement in terms of therapy, it's largely unchanged compared to what has been the case, except for minor modifications. And what is driving this? So we actually went back and collected samples from initially over 30 patients who progressed on uh, chemotherapy. And now we have expanded this collection to over 90 samples collected at the time of relapse. These are sicker patients. They were sick to begin with, they're even, more, even sicker at the time of progression. And it's very hard to get biopsies. And to the best of my knowledge, this is the very first paper looking at the whole exome and transcriptome analysis of samples at the time of relapse from small cell lung cancer. And we saw something very interesting. And we saw a loss of um, APC regulated targets at the time of relapse with the concurrent upregulation of wind signaling pathway at the time of uh, relapse. In other words, activation of wind signaling pathway seemed to be quite dominant in small cell lung cancers. Other groups have reported other alterations, particularly in the DNA repair pathway using patient rep xenograph mouse models. We didn't see that in human samples. And we are more confident of that now, now that we've done over 90 samples and we've done single cell sequencing of that as well. So we believe that this is an important, if not the only mechanism of resistance. And when we take a few thousand samples and do single cell sequencing, this is again a beautiful emerging technology. We can really tell you how, how uh, uh, complex these alterations, this is one patient sample where this patient did not respond to any therapy at all. And when we did the single cell sequencing, we see multiple mechanism mechanisms of resistance in a single patient here. And the ASCL1 is a common transcription factor that is associated with chemo responsiveness, neuro D1 often with chemo resistance. In this sample, we see only a small cluster of sensitive samples driven by ASCL1, but multiple mechanisms of resistance driven by neuro D1 make alteration and alteration in EZS2 and activation of the wind signaling pathway throughout and also activation of this um, Vimentin and the EMT or the, uh, or the mesenchymal transition signature present in this and showing once again, these cancers are also very complex and they are not homogenous. And even though they look homogenous in the microscope or, or appearing somewhat monotonous, I would say that these pathways have multiple different pathways of resistance drive this. And this is quite intriguing 
because this patient never responded to any therapy to begin with, not surprisingly, because multiple different mechanisms are working together to make the tumor very resistant to uh, therapies. And that, again, I just thought I would put this slide, even though we haven't published this data, show the power of the genomic technology, particularly the single cell sequencing, how much we can learn from this. So this is of great interest to us because the wind signaling pathway has been associated with, active, with immune therapy resistance in melanoma, uh, showed very nicely by Tom Kajewski's group from Chicago and subsequently in other cancers, including hepatocellular carcinoma. So we're really looking to explore this and the connection between the lack of immune response, immune therapy response in small cell lung cancer. Small cell lung cancer is poised to respond to immune checkpoint inhibitors because it has a very high mutation burden and uh, it is seen almost exclusively in smokers, yet these response to immune therapy inhibitors uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors are not very impressive. And uh, so we think part of that may be related to the activation of wind signaling pathway. And then we're also interested in really figuring out what drives these metastasis. You know, after all, the tumors kill patients often from metastasis and also from resistance to therapy. So these are important areas for us to study. And a lot of um, the analysis, the, can, the large scale genomic analysis from TCG and CPTAC come from primary untreated tumors from the primary sites, not from metastatic sites. So this is an area of great interest. In the interest of time, I won't go into the details, but we actually did a study where we took primary tumors and then we took the patient's corresponding brain metastasis to really ask the question, what is different in the brain metastasis compared to the patient's own primary tumor? So, these are not easy samples to come by because not every patient with primary tumor as, uh, goes for surgical resection of the brain metastasis and not everybody who goes for brain metastasis has adequate quality primary tumors. But we managed to get a handful of them. And this work was supported by the, uh, the National Cancer Institute R01 grant. And we saw a couple of interesting things. The tumor cells in the, in, in the lung cancer tumor cells, lung adenocarcinoma cells to be more precise, in the tumor look more like those adopting this brain system, uh, brain uh, uh, development. And they also had down-regulation of the immune response gene at the brain. It's almost like these tumor cells have down, downplayed the immune response and then upregulated the CNS development, even though they all came from the lung epithelium. And it's almost like adopting the local environment. And we, this is a paper, again, not published yet. We showed that the, compared to the primary tumor, the metastasis have upregulation of the oligodendrocyte signature, astrocyte uh, signature. And it is not related to the tumor purity. It is, these things have adopted the transcription mechanism. One hypothesis we have is that these are primitive cells. They go there. And these are cells that have more like stem cells, cancer stem cells. They have open chromatin and they then respond to the local ligands and adapt the neuronal signature. And we show further on during the epigenetic studies, compared to the normal tissue from the same patient, the primary tumor, the metastasis of enrichment of the methylation in what are we call the DNA methylation valleys in certain gene. Here is a PAC6 uh, neurodevelopmental gene. And this is where some transcription factor bind to drive the transcription um, along this uh, neuronal pathway. So we do find that there's a mechanistic explanation of why these things adopt the neuronal signature. So these things need to be studied more, but we think that eventually we'll be able to tease out the mechanisms using these samples, having a right set of uh, you know, samples from primary and the corresponding metastasis, using the full power of the genomic technology and the proteomics and epigenomics. And I think we'll be able to slowly figure out how these metastases come about, how they evade the immune system, how they adapt the local environment, et cetera. So again, this is truly, truly uh, fascinating to understand the mechanisms of these disease processes. And my fourth story related to what leads to cancer. You know, as you know, um, in some cancers, uh, a higher proportion of these cancers are driven by inherited susceptibility for cancer. For example, some breast cancers are driven by uh, uh, mutations in BRCA1, BRCA2, prostate cancer that you are well aware of. And in the, can in the, can in the TCGA project, we did, uh, we looked at the genomic alterations in the tumor cells uh, from over 11,000 tumor samples. But we also collected the germline samples, either from peripheral blood or the normal tissue like skin biopsies, mostly peripheral blood. And we wanted to ask this question, what are the pathogenic germline variants we are finding in these uh, TCGA samples? And this paper was published led by my colleague Lee Ding a couple of years ago. 
And the important message is when we looked at 33 cancer types from 11,000 patients, we found that um, about 800 of them or 8% of them had some germline alterations that could have predisposed them to cancer. And as one can imagine, most of them are tumor suppressors, as you can see, few are oncogenic, and a lot of them are pathogenic, uh, as you can see in the green, are likely pathogenic, and they, they affected a number of different genes, largely in the DNA repair pathway, I would say. And uh, we also showed in the paper that these gene, that germline alteration has sculpted the tumor genomic alterations as well. For example, if you have um, germline alterations in ATM, we very rarely saw P53 mutations. They were kind of mutually exclusive. And um, so really the germline uh, susceptibility, not only germline alterations, not only confer susceptibility to cancer, but they also kind of alter or, or sculpt the tumor genomic alterations. And this is an area where I think we're gonna learn a lot more as we have more and more samples coming out, both from the commercial use as well as from the discoveries that uh, many of us are doing. And I think this, this area is gonna grow. But the important point is that the TCGA, about 8% of the cancers from the areas had some germline alterations that may have predisposed them. And lung cancer is about five to 6%. But one area of great interest to us, closer to my own heart is lung cancer never smokers. And a paper that, that hopefully will be published in a few months. And we compared the data from the CPTAC the TCGA and our own data set. And we found that, um, you know, regardless of the smokers or non-smokers, roughly about six to 7% of germline alterations. And that's the take home message from the slide. I won't bore you with the rest of it, but that's the important thing. And the, the, the key message we were looking for here is, do, do non-smokers, you know, they're not exposed to tobacco smoking, what's causing this? Were they born with inherited susceptibility for um, like cancer, the answer is no. It's about the same percentage we see both in smokers and non-smokers with the genes that we are aware of currently. Our knowledge may grow in the coming years. Some other genes that we are not thinking of currently may predispose patients to cancer. So that number may change. But with the current knowledge of cancer associated genes, we think it's about the same. And uh, we are going deeper into the paper as to what else could be causing these things in, in these patients. And then uh, what else can we do with this cancer genome sequencing? Can we predict the outcomes? And um, so far we've been talking about the discovery susceptibility, the alterations that we can go after for, uh, for um, you know, targeted therapies. I I've completely left out the tumor stroma, how we can predict the response to uh, the immune microenvironment, how we can respond, predict the response to immune checkpoint inhibitors out of this talk in the interest of time. But can we predict the outcomes in response to uh, you know, therapy um, like surgery or uh, systemic chemotherapy? And this is the work we did using samples we collected as a part of a prospective study, uh, several prospective studies, I should say, from, from the International Lung Cancer Association. Um, and we collected over a thousand uh, samples. Uh, they were all 15, 20 years old. It was an oil pain in the neck to do the study because the sample quality was really poor. We looked at 1,000 genes, we went 1,000-fold depth. We showed that the higher mutation burden predicted better outcomes. And again, these are good for hypothesis generation. They are not very useful if a patient sits in front of you to say whether you need adjuvant therapy, what's gonna to happen to you in five, 10 years. Uh, but we need to do a little bit more, a little bit more um, um, sensitive and more uh, detailed studies. And that we hope to achieve through the Alchemist program that uh, we are currently uh, you know, overseeing or uh, conducting as a part of the National Cancer Trial Network. And uh, this is slightly outdated and uh, we have now collected over 6,000 samples uh, from resected non-small cell lung cancer, including about 400 from EGFR mutant patients and a thousand plus, I'm sorry, hundred plus in ALK positive lung cancer. And in fact, uh, a few thousands of them already have been completely sequenced using whole genome and exome and we'll be asking questions can we predict outcomes in response to therapy? Can we predict outcomes in patients who are, who are assigned to observation to see how we can use the genomic information to predict who would need adjuvant therapy, who would uh, do well, or who would not do well despite adjuvant therapy. So this effort just uh, launched the genomic analysis and I expect it's gonna take a couple of years to tease this all out. And the number of, uh, number of important observations will be made, I'm confident, out of this analysis. My dear friend, Charlie Swanton has done some nice work in this area where he showed that 
we can look at this in the cell-free DNA and we can show that in some tumors, uh, the tumor cell-free DNA in the peripheral blood dips down after surgery and then goes up before clinically becomes obvious. In some patients, the tumor samples or the cell-free DNA uh, goes down and then these patients never have relapsed because it never goes up. And there's a lot of interest in looking at cell-free DNA in early stage lung cancer, also in locally advanced non-small cell lung cancer treated with chemo radiation. This is a work from my colleague, stage three non-small cell lung cancer. He showed that when he was in Stanford, patient with stage three non-small cell lung cancer, a higher circulating DNA compared to stage one non-small cell lung cancer. And then if you do the cell-free DNA at diagnosis and at four months after completion of chemo radiation, he made an important observation. After four months, if you didn't find any cell-free DNA, these patients did very well uh, compared to those who had persistent cell-free DNA. So what does this tell you? It tells you that if you have persistent cell-free DNA, you are at a high risk for relapse after chemo radiation. So maybe we can enroll them in, in thoughtful clinical studies. These are high-risk patients, and we can enroll them in clinical trials to really identify what can help them. Of course, this was done before the era of using immune checkpoint blockade, and it'll be interesting to ask the same question after a few months of immune checkpoint blockade. Will some of these patients be rescued by immune checkpoint blockade? Will some of them will still show the same thing after a few months of immune checkpoint blockade? All these are interesting questions that we and others are asking these questions as you move along. And then in the last few minutes, I do want to point out uh, this uh, paper we published a few months ago, where we actually completely took it to a different uh, uh, line of investigation. We did not start by doing the sequencing. We, we took a sample of tumor, and sequenced them using whole exome and transcriptome, we found these new antigens. These are antigens that these patients, uh, the normal cells don't have, and present only in the tumor cells. And then we created the peptides for these new antigens and then injected them back to the patients in order to mount an immune response, essentially teach the immune system to go after the tumor cells. And these are very early days. And we showed that we, in combination with immune checkpoint inhibitors, these new antigens actually do work. And we also have, um, and apart from the, not only we create the response to those antigens, um, and we also showed the epitope spread where the immune system started working on other um, uh, targets that we didn't really vaccinate these patients for. And those who had the epitope spread did pretty well. And this is, this is like a very early days uh, um, of, of new antigen-based vaccine therapy. And I, I do think this field will move forward if you can understand better how to predict the new antigen using computer the algorithms and functional studies. We are just in the very early days. And if you can do a better prediction, that I think would be a great way to move this field forward. Second, we also have to understand the tumor microenvironment and try to really come up with individualized checkpoint block rather than giving them every, giving everybody a PD-1, PDL one uh, derived checkpoint block it. And with further uh, modifications of these uh, efforts, I think we'll be able to go really into truly personalized therapy where we customize these products for individual patients. In fact, there are patients of mine who have gone through this preparation, something happened to them, but we could never use them because it's customized only for one patient. This is the ultimate personalized therapy, and we have learned quite a bit. What is remarkable here is this is no longer a year and a half process to sequence this. In this instance, we actually did the DNA RNA sequencing within two weeks and predicted the new antigen prediction within a couple of weeks and then started off the vaccine preparation within a short time and showing once again, how fast science can move forward in, in 10 years. And then um, I would just uh, point out to the larger group here that there'll be a lot of data coming out of the CPTAC, the proteomic analysis, every single sample will have a genomic analysis as well. So we'll have a comprehensive analysis of all these um, proteogenomic uh, studies and there'll be a ton of information coming out of these things. There's also a big effort currently ongoing and we and others are part of this uh, called the Human Tumor Atlas Network we collect samples from uh, cancer patients at multiple different points using all kinds of technology, including single cell sequencing to really understand the heterogeneity, the impact, the effect on the biology, et cetera. This is really souped up by TCGA and that's gonna give us a lot of information. A talk 10 years from now, a similar talk would look very different because I'm hoping by then we'd have learned significant amount in terms of complexities of these alterations and uh, these efforts are going on. Um, uh, significantly as we move forward. And I think what we have to address as we move forward is what are the mechanisms underlying metastasis? 
I showed you one example of primary to brain metastasis, or these shared between various cancers. In other words, the metastatic process of lung cancer in the brain is the same in breast cancer, brain metastasis, renal cell cancer, brain metastasis, melanoma, brain metastasis, or the other way around. When a lung cancer metastasizes to the liver, or these same factors govern the metastasis to the brain, to the liver, what is unique and what are shared between these two across the tumor types? I think those will be addressed by individual groups of investigators and also through the effort like the uh, H10 network I showed you. And there's also a new, process, new effort, MetNet work as well, to look at these metastatic processes very carefully. And we're also studying um, these processes and other systems and models, and we are really trying to figure this out as we move along. What are the mechanisms governing tumor dormancy and what dictates the recurrence? And uh, we are now able to poise to understand tumor microenvironment better than we have ever been able to in the past. And as we are getting more sophisticated, we are now, thanks to generosity of our patients, and we are able to understand the mechanisms of resistance to targeted therapies and immune therapy by getting biopsies at the time of progression. And even more, the ultimate act of generosity, a number of our patients have consented to autopsy studies where we collect uh, these samples within four hours. We call them warm autopsies so that we can get them before the nucleic acid um, uh, gets um, uh, degraded. And we have been able to do a number of those uh, warm autopsies and where we can get samples from multiple different sites. In an average patient's um, uh, tumor, uh, we get about 20, 25 different tumor biopsies and a single autopsy uh, from various different sites. And that will be able to answer some of the questions I posed. And I didn't talk about this at all today, but this is an important area of research, sex specific and racial differences. In fact, 90% of the samples from the uh, TCG analysis are biased towards Caucasian uh, populations. So we know very little about these racial differences. And there are interestingly sex specific differences that we have not been paying attention to. My colleague, Josh Rubin has done beautiful work in this area in uh, brain metastasis in uh, brain tumors, showing how the male gliomas are driven by certain pathways compared to female gliomas. And I think those things need to be studied. Again, this is of great interest to me because lung cancer never smokers. We see that mostly in women uh, rather than men. And uh, truly, um, uh, so that's something that we're really interested in studying in, in the coming years. And in, in closing, I would, I would point out this beautiful line from written, beautiful statement written uh, you know, 2000 plus years ago, and uh, really uh, hones in on this, not knowing the other, not knowing oneself in every battle, you're guaranteed certain defeat. And that's exactly how we were approaching cancer before. Now, all these um, discussions today really goes to the heart of what is driving this cancer? What are these alterations? Cancer is uh, uniquely, uh, is a unique disease in the sense that we have not only a tumor genome, a tumor proteome, but also we have a normal tissue to compare and see what has changed in this. It's a little harder to do in other diseases, uh, but cancer really lends itself to this elegant analysis and if you cannot figure this out in cancer, it'll be tougher to figure out in other cancers what genomic alterations underpin these diseases. The cancer is certainly a model disease uh, to do it, and we should be exploiting that in order to improve the outcomes of these patients and improve the lives of our patients and make cancer um, you know, a disease that we can uh, cure more and more, at least contain with a very limited amount of morbidity from treatment. So that's what... Um, I think our goal is in the next um, 10, 15 years. And I hope I gave you a flavor of what could be done with this. I appreciate your attention. I want to thank you for inviting me again. I'm, oh, I'm ready to answer any questions you may have. Dr. Govindan, thank you for a beautiful lecture, clear, exciting, and certainly inspirational. I have a question in terms of thinking about the future. I mean, clearly you've demonstrated that once a diagnosis of cancer has made the opportunities for understanding the genetic alterations can influence treatment and how we go about it and, and survival. And you were getting to it a little bit uh, with the germ cell mutations. The question is how far away or can you ever envision the possibility of utilizing genetics in terms of cancer prevention? We understand clearly that there are environmental factors, but and there may be some genetic predispositions. But if we were to recognize hotspots 
or air, some micro environments early on, could we possibly prevent cancer from happening? Dr. Weiss, first of all, thanks for again for your warmth and hospitality here. Um, I, who would know that you could be so hospitable over Zoom? So, <laughs> and, um, you know, thanks for your kind words. But I think it's a great question. So I, I would say this, uh, there is this um, effort going on looking at the epigenetic alteration. So the genomic alteration, the cell-free DNA analysis with the current technology is a little hard to find when you have a very early cancer or very limited cancer. I am very skeptical that even in stage one or two lung cancer, after the section, cell-free DNA will be that useful to predict who would recur, who would not recur, because the amount of cell-free DNA is not very high. In cancer prevention, it's even more, because you're talking about the precancerous lesions, so it is gonna be very daunting and challenging. To overcome that, uh, there are, there's a grail is pursuing this, where they are looking at epigenetic alterations, and uh, you know, there's a, you're gonna hear about this in the coming years and uh, there is a lot of effort to look at this, but here is a challenge. You, know, you have to be very careful what you wish for. There are more tears shed over answered prayers than unanswered prayers. So you may find a lot of alterations that may not mean anything. For example, we ran into this, Tim Lay beautifully reported many years ago that uh, we find this, um, what we call arch here because of St. Louis uh, clonal hematopoiesis uh, that uh, we identify in these tumors. People have DNM23A mutation or some even P53, even Keras mutations we've seen. They're healthy individuals. And, uh, and uh, these are healthy individuals carry these mutations and uh, what Tim Lay calls a soft kiss of death. It doesn't really lead to cancer, but then a few other mutations would lead to cancer. So we may find a lot of these alterations that you may be able to live with, with even normal duration of life and that may not mean anything, that may generate a lot of additional you know, uh, test and investigation that may lead to more problems. So we gotta be careful about that. So there is that thing. So I'm a little worried about that and uh, hopefully we'll sort out. So th maybe some of them will help identify some of those who are about to at high risk for cancer. But, but I'm a little cynical, and I could be wrong, uh, Dr. Weiss, that I think cancer is a random disease. You can really prevent so much. And it is, it is, it is um, you know, high-risk behavior can be, you know, you, you could really identify those patients. You could identify who is at risk among smokers, among former smokers. I think those areas are worth pursuing. But the notion that we can eliminate cancer, I think, is a little too... Um, tricky and dangerous, over-promising and a delivery thing. So I, I, I'm giving a long-winded answer, but the short answer is that technology will help us a little bit more to identify those who are at high risk for cancer. But I personally, I'm very skeptical that it's going to prevent all of these cancers. Thank you. Any, any questions from the group? The shy group. You, you bowed us over, it was just wonderful. Dr. Govindan, we hope we have the opportunity to welcome you. Oh, Craig, do you have a question? No, I don't. I was just gonna say um, thank you, G, for, uh, for, for gracing us. And um, was, the, your talk was wonderful, but I knew that it would be, um, hence your invitation. So um, again, it's great, great to see you again. Great to see you, Craig, again. Thank you, Dr. Wise. Thanks everyone for being here. Thank you so much. Travel safely home. <laughs> <laughs> I have bye, to everyone. Be, be healthy. It's be well. Coming. We'll be so in touch. That's true. Bye, bye. Thank you. Okay, bye.